Hi there, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I want to talk about interop with C++. Somewhat inspired by the Carbon language, it is an effort announced recently by Google, which tries to make a more modern language that's still compatible with C++ semantics and interops well with it. It's sort of like they want to be to C++ what Kotlin is to Java, but it's not ready for use. They have an interpreter, but they don't have a compiler. And last I tried it, I couldn't get any C++ interop to work. So we won't actually be looking at it today, but hopefully we will sometime in the future. Meanwhile, there are other languages today that do interop with C++. D is one of these. And they point out here that being 100% compatible with C++ means you need a fully functional C++ compiler because the only standard way of expressing the C++ language and its semantics is through C++ source. And with the focus of D on its own end-to-end -end compiler, that influences how they look at interop with C++. Also, there are semantic differences between the languages. So for example, as a result, D cannot directly call C++ special member functions like constructors, destructors, and so on. So I looked only a little bit at D on this topic. Another language I didn't look at a whole lot was Rust, although options for interop do exist. What I focused on instead were the Yacht and NIM programming languages. Both of these languages, unlike D, focus on compiling to C++ in order to get interop with C++, which is a very different strategy than how D works with it. So if you compile a C++, then you can leverage an existing C++ compiler to do the rest of the work for you. And Yacht is an effort associated with the Serenity operating system that had been doing all of its development in C++ until some recent interest in using a memory safe language. And Yacht is a lot like Swift with reference counting and so on and a lot of other things that look similar, but it's designed to interop more with C++ than how Swift was designed to interop more with Objective-C. Yacht is also a very new effort. NIM on the other hand is a more mature language with semantics not really designed around C++ interop and in fact, originally it compiled through C, but they added C++ support along the way, and it's actually rather thorough at this point. Common memory management in NIM these days also uses reference counting. And for our demo, we'll be interfacing to the Bullet Physics C++ library. And Bullet does like to emphasize their Python support these days, so likely they have some kind of C API as well, but the original library is written in C++, and that's where the core feature set is defined. And so we're gonna to interface to C++ today. And here's the hello world you see in the bullet repository. I've adapted and modified and cleaned this up some for our purposes today. So let's take a look at the code. Here we set up the world. We put some gravity falling at hmm, 10 meters per second squared, create a flat ground and a sphere to drop on it. And that's all we do. The ground cube is centered at negative 56 with an extent of 50. So the floor is actually at negative six. And the sphere falls from a Y of 10 with a radius of one so it comes to rest around negative five Y. And then we just go through 150 time steps where each one represents a 60th of a second and print it as we go. So all I expect you to do is see a sphere fall to the ground. If we run it, it's not very exciting output. I'm printing things out here. And here's the Y coordinate along this right axis here where object zero is the static ground that doesn't move. And object one is a sphere that has fallen to a center of negative five. And we see it started up at higher values coming down. Now, looking at this text is not very fun. So let's pipe it through something to plot with. We see it started at 10, fell to about negative five, maybe went through a floor a tiny bit, but then stabilized above it. Not a very interesting physics demo, not taking much advantage of 3D, but it gets our feet wet using the Bullet API. Bullet can do a lot more than that, but we won't today. So here's the quick plotting script, just parses the output and plots it. And here's the build script where I've run the demo through Valgrind, which lets us see that we had no leaks. There were 51 allocs and freeze, and about four and a half megabytes total of memory that got allocated during the run and zero memory errors. Let's look a little bit more how this program is organized. First, I have this thing I call a dynamics world store. That's my own thing, where I have all these helper values constructed and then use them in constructing the dynamics world. I also have a destructor to do some custom cleanup logic that loops through all the objects in the world and cleans them up manually before all these things get cleaned up automatically as value members of the dynamics world store struct. I also added some convenience for creating rigid bodies from a mass, an origin position, and a shape. 
And so notice I have value types, const references, pointers, and so on here. And then to print things out, I loop across the collision objects, use a static method for casting them, get their position, and print things out. And that's what we parsed in the Python for plotting to the screen. So that's how the C++ works. Let's take a look at Yacht now, which looks in some ways like C++, some ways like Swift, some ways like Rust. I started out trying to make a Dynamics World object, but backed off from it for reasons that I'll get to. Instead, I made all those things just locals inside of main. Instead of a destructor, I have a defer block for cleaning things up. Let's go ahead and run this before we get too far. Here I said run yacht. And I'll show that script in a minute too. Here we see as before, we have our parabolic fall from the ball falling to the floor. And we have about 4.6 megs instead of 4.5 megs, along with thousands of allocations and not as many frees. So we had no memory errors, though we did have some leak. And in my exploration, I found that that was from the printing process. Worth pointing out, by the way, in everything I show in Yacht today, that Yacht is under heavy development, it's not 1.0 yet, and I'm actually a few weeks behind on the latest version I'm using, about 143 commits behind the head of main. So it could be that even some of the things we see today are not really representative of the current state of Yacht, and or I may have just used things wrong. Anyway, back to main which I chose to put before my helper functions because Yacht can reorder those things for me. And one thing we see differently from C++ is that I have to declare my variables as mutable if I want to be able to change them. And I can get raw pointers to them if I want or mutable or immutable references. And here I create my shapes and init the bodies and add them to the world. Notice that I have named arguments here. These even are named arguments calling into C++ and we'll see how that works in a second. Also note my float32 literals here, that look somewhat like Rust literals, aren't super happy with the Swift highlighting that I turned on. Because while this language is sort of like Swift, it's got a lot of differences too. And to see some other things that I ended up doing here, in my clean dynamics world, I can take some advantage of nice features in Yacht like range looping. And some of my C++ features work here as well, like my static call to upcast. But I couldn't figure out how to check to see if things were null or not. Yacht has its own notions of optional types and I couldn't figure out how they integrated with just simple null pointers. So I used inline C++, which I've marked as unsafe, in order to do the test that I needed to. I also couldn't figure out how to call delete from Yacht. But wherever I could figure it out, I interfaced to the bullet library from Yacht instead of using inline CPP. I also couldn't figure out how to map over the operator for square brackets. So for the object array that I got from bullet, I used the at method instead. I also wrote one whole function directly in a C++ header because I couldn't figure out how to call static cast for working around some issues I had. And I couldn't figure out how to make top level functions with inline CPP and Yacht either. But most of my interfacing to bullet is inside of a separate module I made for declaring the extern interface. I've declared the bindings here. And I didn't even look to see what options are available for auto-generating bindings from C++ header files. I wanted to do it all manually today to see what the process was like. I don't even know if such tools exist for Yacht. They do for NIM, but even when we get to that, I did it manually. So this here says that when using these extern features, we need to make sure to include this header. And I can declare extern structs. If I include a this in an extern function, it means it's a member function for an instance. And if I don't have a this, it means it's a top level some kind of static function, or in this case, constructor. And when I declare these functions, I can make my parameters anonymous, meaning I pass them in by position or the default is that they are named. So here when I called the constructor with dispatcher, overlapping pair cache, and so on, they match the names I declared here in the external interface. When it compiles to C++ code, it'll end up being positional. So that's a feel for the kinds of things I do for declaring the bindings between Yacht and C++, because Yacht, again, can't directly access a C++ header. Now it's interesting, maybe something like this can be done in the future, like, for example, the zig language can directly include C language header files and use them without any kind of separate binding stage. But zig specifically focuses on C interop and not C++, which is why I didn't include it in today's topic. But who knows, maybe something like Yacht could do that in the future with C++, if they incorporate the Clang library, for example. Anyway, here's my build script. And at least at the time, I had to be a little bit careful about declaring where my Yacht runtime is when I'm building from a separate directory. I can even control which C++ compiler I'm using, but nothing too fancy going on. And this is the C++ it generates. Here I've got these local variables for building my dynamics world, and that defer block that I had becomes a scope guard with a lambda for the cleanup that happens. 
We also see fun things like range types and so on. And we see that these constructions here were done with assignment. So happily, these bullet types support these kind of assignment operations. Now, the reason I didn't make a separate class to store all these things together like I'd done in C++ was because I end up with an error. Let me get rid of the run temporarily and show that error. Well, if I uncomment it first. Here we see C++ errors asking about formatting. And that's because Yacht wants to be able to format out the types that I define. But I don't have format defined for these types inside of bullet. Maybe there's something straightforward I could have done either in Yacht or in C++ to make this work. But I didn't go to that effort for working on this video, which is why I made no separate type. Although it would be interesting, either in Yacht or NIM, to have these kinds of reference counted classes where I could store a number of C++ values in line such that whenever this gets reference counted and cleaned up at zero references, all these destructors get called automatically. That'd be great. And maybe I could have done it with a little more effort. But let's move on to NIM now. And here in NIM, I've also chosen to set up my dynamics world with local variables inside of main, though for a different reason than why I did it in Yacht. However, I do have defer again, which is interesting. And I'm making my shapes, adding them to the world, then looping, stepping my simulation, and printing out again. And at the bottom, I call main, because NIM has a little more of a scripting language kind of feel to it. To get my addresses or raw pointers to things, I use the unsafe adder feature of NIM, because NIM, like Yacht, focuses on safety by default. Then for my functions up here, I can loop across my collision objects. I can call static methods, though it looks differently, that's because there's a little more flexibility in your mapping between NIM and C++. We'll see that in a minute. I can even call new to allocate and delete to delete them. Here's that binding using weird templatey looking stuff. But before we get too far, let's prove that the NIM code works. And here we see the same parabolic fall as before. And interestingly, the 51 Alex, 51 freeze, and just under four and a half megabytes of memory usage for NIM matches exactly what we saw in C++. We also have zero errors and no memory leaks. Again, NIM is a mature language that hit 1.0 some years ago. And in terms of understanding what we see here in NIM, it's worth pointing out NIM has uniform function call syntax. So delete here is a procedure that takes some kind of pointer, but I can either call it like this, or in trailing dot mode, and it means the same thing to NIM. So let's look a bit more now at how these bindings work. Here I've declared a number of types, and I've said they all use the bullet header library, which I can just declare as a constant here and reuse that variable throughout. But I do have to mention it on each individual thing where I'm using import CPP. This is the type behind the scenes. This is the name I'm gonna call it by in NIM. And I can also declare relationships between these types, which is something that I couldn't do, at least in the old version of Yacht that I'm using. And down here in the function mapping that I'm doing, I can declare constructors by calling them constructor. And this at means take whatever parameters I've received and pass them all in to this call. So we get sort of like a little bit of a template mechanism for describing how calls in NIM translate to calls in C++. A pound is any one argument, and at is all the remaining ones. And NIM also has named args, such as dispatcher, overlapping pair cache, and so on, which match to these arg names I've given in the NIM bindings. And in Yacht and in NIM, these turn into positional arguments in the end. So here's what the build script looks like, very much like what we've seen before. And I'm specifically using release mode and the cyclical reference counting memory management. So let's see what the C++ looks like behind the scenes. Here are my local variables. In this case, because I said they were constructors in NIM, it actually constructed them in place instead of using equals assignments like we saw in Yacht. Looks like it also did some inlining of my arithmetic during the compile process. But let's go back to something here where I said that I did not make a separate container type for all these things. In Yacht, I didn't because I didn't work out how to do a formatter. And in NIM, I didn't for a different reason. So here's a type I could have used. And here's my function to make one. Here, I'm trying to construct my value all at once in the end based on other predefined things. Let me go ahead and call this so we make sure it gets included in the compile process. I'll say whatever equals that thing. Then I'm going to 
discard whatever so that I don't get warnings for unused variables. Let's try building this again. We get errors, not in the NIM, but in the C++. Let's see what happened here. Whatever is a call to Dynamics World Store. Let's see if we can figure out where this got defined at. at make Dynamics World Store is what we're looking for. Here we are. Sometimes it's hard to navigate through this code, but it's not so bad we can't make sense of it. So here's our attempt at creating an object, actually initializing this Dynamics World. But it doesn't really work because it ended up defining this up front which means it had to have done some default constructors right here on all the contained types. And some of these types don't have default constructors. So because of that, it couldn't actually build the code that it tried to. There might be a way to work around this, but I didn't find it in my own exploration. So overall, I was rather pleased with the kind of flexibility I had in NIM. So for example, down here I could say transform.origin equals origin. And what is that doing? Here inside of my bindings that I wrote, which was a lot of effort, and I may have made some mistakes, I could define an origin assignment and say that calls the set origin method in the bullet API. If we look for where that's being used, we see that we get a transform.setOrigin call, even though in NIM, it looks like an assignment because NIM has that kind of abstraction and flexibility in the bindings I'm writing. Anyway, before we're done, let's take a look at D. So I did explore a tiny bit here, but it's a very different process. Here I said I have X turn C++, although all I've done with it is make a vector three. And instead of just saying vector three exists, like I did in NIM or in Yoct, in D I've had to give the details of what's inside of it, because D is going to separately compile the D and the C++ and then link them together afterward, instead of compiling to C++ source. Also, in an earlier version, I made these dynamically allocated on the heap, so I had to do a binding to delete since that's not directly included in support inside of D. But I'm using value type here, which is struct, and I'm calling a separately defined function for creating one because I can't call constructors. And I also made separate functions for doing x, y, and z because the get x, get y, and get z from bullet didn't work here because these are inlined header only functions and we're not using the header from C++. So there's nothing to link to in the bullet library. So I had to create quite a bit of bindings that included actual function definitions here to interface to the bullet library, both for calling constructors or for calling things that had been defined in the header. Although D, like NIM, does have uniform function call syntax, so I can say dot X instead of saying X of something. So it looks really nice in the end. Let's prove this part does work. And we see that we have printed out the two for the y of my vector. And I've got one, two, three when printing out all three values. I access the floats member directly here. But see, I got rid of this and that and tried building it again now. Whereas before, I had zero errors. I now have 138 errors. Because instead of relying on the definition of bt vector three from bullets headers, it has to make space on the stack here according to what I tell it it is in my decode in the bindings I've made. If I put this in floats back in again, my other functions that I wrote in C++ will work because now D will know how big a BT vector three is. And there's the one, two, three again. And here's what the build process looks like. I create a binary object with G++ and then I link it in when I call the DMD compiler. Anyway, doing a full binding to bullet would be a lot more effort in D than in Yoct or NIM because of this. Although I think D does have some automating tools for going through the header file and trying to do some of the work for you. I didn't try that out again in any of the languages I looked at today. Anyway, we've seen some of the ways of trying to go about interfacing to C++ and seen some varying levels of success with the effort that I put in. And we did prove we can definitely interface to C++ libraries from other languages. I hope this has been fun. Maybe we can look at interop in other ways in the future as well. If you like the video, be sure to subscribe. Bye y'all.